thanks for, for inviting me again. I've been here at the third conference when I spoke about my book on Polish and Soviet child forced laborers. And now at the fifth conference, I'm more than happy to talk about the second volume in this small series on Jewish child forced laborers, 1938-1945. And maybe both, there will be a seventh conference, and, and you never know. Well, maybe. May, maybe there's another book by, by then, and we'll see. So this project on, on Jewish child forced laborers kept me busy for about 10, 12 years parallel to the book on on uh, Soviet and, and Polish child forced laborers. And I was particularly interested in three areas of research, the experience of war forced labor and the Holocaust, the participation of German civil and military institutions, in particular the military institution and Jewish child forced labor, and then forced labor ideology and occupation policies. I have two central categories for analysis. One is gender and the other one is age. And based on my experience reading the literature, age is often a bit in the corner. It's not really uh, treated and, and used as a category for analysis. So by using age and gender as categories for analysis, my aim was to identify the historical background of Jewish child forced labor and its place within the Holocaust, access the types of their employment, evaluate the part uh, participation of civil authorities, police and military units in the employment process, analyze the children's working and living conditions, treatment, contacts with non-Jewish population and other forced laborers, to investigate abuse in including heterosexual and homosexual rape, to explore forms of passive and active resistance, to discuss how the experience of forced labor and survival has been narrated in the testimonies. And, and that's all what most of the testimonies do <coughs> cover. As I like to travel and I, as I regard myself as an old-fashioned historian, I traveled widely to the archives, and I, I love to go to exotic places like Vienna and Berlin. Uh, but, yeah. but the main basis of the book and my research were, of course, the testimonies, and there were a lot of. So analytical categories, areas of research, documents from the archives, as far as they were available, testables, led to wrong, to a book and the contents of the book in four larger chapters, policies and occupation, ghettos and camps, experiences and memoirs, and last but not least, the final stage of the war and liberation. Jewish child forced laborers worked in all branches of industry, in mining, agriculture, and construction work. They were forced to build production plants, bridges, roads, and railway tracks, barracks, airfields, defensive positions, and trenches. Over weeks, months, and years, they had to carry out exhausting work, often way beyond their physical strength, and that was intended, and there are documents that this was intended. The total number of Jewish child force laborers is unknown. Statistics do not exist. Estimates depend on the definition of childhood, who is a child, which varies between 12 and 18 years in academic literature. Most recent research tends to follow the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child, and so did I, and so in, for the purpose of, of my research, I follow this UN Convention and regard a child as every human being below the age of 18 years when forced to work. Using this definition and the very wide and liberal definition of forced labor from the International Labor Organization 1930, which in a nutshell leaves it to the victim to make the decision, was my work forced labor or not, and not leave it to the Nazi documents or to the courts or whatever. 
If you follow both age limitation and this very liberal wide definition, we, it's safe to say that at least several hundred thousand of Jewish children have been forced to work, maybe a million, maybe one and a half million, and of course children aged during that process. Somebody who was 16 in 1939 when first was forced to work in a ghetto or outside the ghetto, that child was no longer a child in 1945, or then 21. At the end of the war, an estimated 150,000 Jewish children survived the Holocaust in Europe outside the Soviet Union, while 1 to 1.5 million had been murdered. The survivors of the Holocaust were shaped by external and internal wounds, scars, disabilities, and traumatic experiences. They lost parents, other family members, and friends. Child survivors often lost any trust in adults at all. Over months and years, they lived, their lives were characterized by the vicinity of death, forced labor, hunger, thirst, and humiliation. Many were sexually abused. Some endured forced sterilization and medical experiments. In general, only children whom the Germans regarded as useful laborers had a chance of surviving the camps and ghettos. Irrespective of its size, Jewish forced labor in general and Jewish child forced labor in particular are relatively under-researched areas in international research, whereas the forced labor of non-Jews has been widely researched during the last decades. In particular, forced labor carried out in Germany, not in the occupied areas. Moreover, most of the Contemporary German documents were destroyed during the war. Traditional historians, however, hesitate to fill the data gap by using personal accounts, even though some personal accounts originate from the final stage of the war or its immediate aftermath. Another factor is that, to quote uh, Wolf Gruner, uh, research studies have scarcely considered forced labor to be an important factor in Nazi anti-Jewish policy, but rather as an intermediate solution or as a separate step on the way to mass murder." End of quote. Times began to change when Wolf Gruner's path-breaking work, Jewish Forced Labor Under the Nazis, was published in 2006. While Raoul Hilberg, Falk Pingel, and Christopher Browning, among others, published on Jewish Forced Labor before 2006, it was Browning 2010 study that prominently demonstrated that research on Jewish forced labor can be taken into a new level by using survivors' accounts. It was the aim of my study to analyze and describe the history of Jewish child forced labor as remembered and reflected in their testimonies. And this was not without methodolo methodological and ethical challenges and risk, and Boas had asked me to focus on some of them, and I will focus on six points. <coughs> First, ethical issues. We just had a short discussion about ethical issues and voyeurism. During the last, that, that depends on, the discussion depends on the fact that child forced laborers are full of stories, of brutal, of most brutal stories. And the question is, should these stories go into a book or not, or a selection of these stories, or should we describe it in more general? We had heard yesterday the concept of uh, the, the ghetto fighter's house. They don't want to scare with using images. When, when, when children. When, when, no. when, when, sorry, when I ask, can we have the discussion perhaps <laughs> later? <laughs> <laughs> When I asked Boas in this, uh, on this area, he, he wrote me, I, I or we here at the college, we do not use shock therapy or something similar. Right. During the last years, I've discussed ethical issues widely with colleagues here in Israel as well as in other countries. Most colleagues encouraged me not to hold back in any way 
the brutalities narrated in survivors' testimonies, even as some readers and book reviewers might label this as voyeuristic. The testimonies of former child force laborers contain such brutalities because it was their experience and it was their intention to share this experience with us. <coughs> Being a child and a forced laborer was a most brutal experience and a study that focuses predominantly on the victims and their testimonies and not on the perpetrators and their documents can hardly ignore these parts of the testimonies and exclude them from publication. For my study, I have, con I have not conducted any interviews myself, but have analyzed far more than 1,000 published and unpublished testimonies, of which around 500 went into the book. Considering that there are probably 100,000 known interviews with survivors of the Holocaust, a figure I've taken from Uma Bartos, Wartime Lies. Having in mind 100,000 100, known interviews, 1,000 testimonies used are only a small fraction of all testimonies available. The task was to find some testimonies that could give answers to the research questions. This was time consuming because the estimated 100,000 testimonies are not yet catalogued uh, catalog completely and the indexes we have are not perfect. Some are good, not to provoke you, uh, but they, they, they are not perfect, but we, we had that discussion before. Ideally, there should be one central, maybe virtual catalog, including a standardized index and information about accessibility of all 100,000 interviews that would make uh, life for us historians much more easier and maybe your work would be easier if these testimonies would be regarded what they are, a world heritage uh, that we have and that we should, that somebody might want to apply for. In general, I was interested in testimonies that not only covered a wide range of child experiences, including gender and age, geographical aspects, different ghettos, camps, workplaces, etc., but it was my task to find testimonies in which the survivors went beyond the factual level and shared their reflections about their experience with the interviews or readers. My approach and intention was not to use personal accounts as a substitute for documents, or to accompany the analysis of documents with a personal touch. In other words, I did not primarily analyze testimonies in order to find new facts and data about forced labor sites, camps, ghettos, and so on. Also, everybody who uses testimonies will find new facts and data. But it was, as I said, my aim to examine personal experience. The factual accuracy of testimonies was a factor I had in mind, but it was a minor factor due to my general focus on the personal experience. And I would like to remind you what Nina Rotem has told us yesterday about uh, uh, child, uh, children's testimonies, and I fully agree with that, what she has said. Nevertheless, testimonies can be used and are being used to establish facts, to bring to light so far unknown details, information and data. However, there is no precise method that allows us to distinguish between facts and fiction. There are, of course, most interesting and detailed theoretical and methodological approaches how to analyze testimonies. If you follow Christopher Browning, there's a simple method which most of us follow most of the time, I assume. In his book, Remembering Survival, Browning explains, quote, my methodology in this project, as it was in my study of reserve battal police battalion 101, is to accumulate a sufficient critical mass of testimonies that can be tested against one another. End of quote. And we had during the conference very, very convincing and, and good examples how colleagues have done that. To test testimonies against each other or to test documents against each other or to test testimonies against documents and vice versa, 
is a common way of working. But it is not a guarantee. Otherwise, we would not question that soap was produced in Auschwitz. The story of soap production in Auschwitz comes up in many testimonies, as most of us might know. At the end of the day, we often have to rely on our instinct. Besides all methodological ideas we have, it is our instinct. At the end of the day, it is our gut feeling in many cases. But this risk to rely on gut feeling and instinct could be minimized if we had critical annotations accompanying the testimony. Maybe annotations that could be updated by researchers while using the testimonies. Sharon, please, who will speak in our uh, 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 panel here, I think you have a third place, um, she will certainly later on give me hell for this remark. A year ago, we had a short discussion in London about it, about annotations. So I do know what I'm talking about. However, after the discussion in, in London, a young colleague from Israel told me that she didn't want to contribute to the discussion, but I should know that her academic place works already with annotations. Also, my focus was on the victim side. I understand myself as an old-fashioned historian who looks for generalizations wherever possible. I work with synopsis collected from hundreds of testimonies and not with a few testimonies only. Don't get me wrong, I, lo I love to read and to listen to publications or papers based on a few life stories only, but this is simply not the way I work. Such generalizations are possible within limits, of course, even if I truly believe that any experience and memory is individual and not collective. And finally, in which way ever we approach the testimonies, we might have to confess that our studies are not representative. In general, hardcore oral historians do not aim for this at all. But for me, as an old-fashioned historian, this is an issue. In this context, I refer to Raoul Hilberg, who in 1973 stated, A, that the survivors of the Shoah are not a random sample of the six million who have been murdered. B, that those who have given testimonies are not a random sam sample of the group of survivors. And that C, the content of their testimonies are not a random sam sample of their experience. We might want to argue that the majority of the 100,000 known testimonies date from post-1973, post the time Raoul Hilberg has made that statement, and that he might argue a bit differently today, might. But we cannot be sure about it as a quantitative sociological analysis of these testimonies has not been carried out so far. However, my study has shown, as some colleagues did before, that the accumulation of a critical mass of testimonies of some of the forced labor sites during specific periods of time allow for generalization. Whether such generalizations are representative or not is a question for discussion. Thank you very much.